do more things for the kingdom of God than before. All right? So I'm, I'm going to kind of blow your minds for a moment, all right, with a, with a I know you can handle this, but I'm going to put an image on the screen, and then I'm going to illustrate over here on the board. Uh, this is the design of an actual image that reflects the studies that were done to come up with this idea of situational leadership that was developed by Hersey and Blanchard, all right? So here we go. So don't be overwhelmed by it. Let me see if I can break it down. It's colorful, but you have to understand it, all right? So I didn't put it in the notes, and I thought it might just be easier for me to address this way. So let me just point out a few things about this. The first thing I want you to see is the big aspect of this. There, do you notice that that little stream that is going through there, do you notice that it's it, it has arrows built in? So the arrows begin in what I would call the southeast quadrant, bottom right quadrant. So we begin there from a timeline. It starts there, and it goes up into from S1 to S2. Then it goes to S3 and down to S4. All right? So that's the movement of this. So it's starting in the lower right quadrant, and it goes up, and then it goes around. Each of these quadrants represent a person who needs a different type of support and development. Their needs are different. They're at a different place. So let me just see, uh, point out the key words, so the, and these are in your notes. In fact, I think you have blanks here so you can fill these in. So these are the four leadership styles that are common to this model. The first one is called directing. A directing leader is someone that is having to basically say, do this. Just go and make dinner. Get it done. It's more command-oriented. It's more directive. It assumes that the person you're talking to doesn't need a lot of support right now. They just need direction. They're young, immature, undeveloped, super sensitive. And so the leader is starting off by simply giving a task, a direction, run from here to there. Get a new box of paper, buy the box of paper, and get it back here. That's just what? It's directive. It's not very supportive, but it's directive. But it is the way you're forced to treat someone and lead someone who is young, inexperienced, doesn't know what to do yet. So you are highly directive. Coaching is the next style. First style is directive. The second one is coaching. A coaching style is where you are still being highly directive, but now you have added to your directive approach support, more positive reinforcement. You imagine a coach uh, of any kind of sport. The coaches are telling you, run this play or move to this position or whatever. But they're also coaches are now coaches are required to be very psychologically in tune. And now they're all aware of what, where the emotional stability is of their players. This player is more sensitive than this player. They have to be good coaches. They have to coach them in the sense of giving them direction, but they also have to be supportive at the same time. How many of you have noticed before a coach that maybe ha has become very directive and then maybe the player does something wrong and they come off the field and, and, and the coach puts their arm around them and they're trying to encourage them. They're coaching them up. They're basically saying, you'll get it next time. Next penalty kick. Don't give up. You see what I'm saying? But they're still being directive highly directive, but now they've added an element of supportive behavior into this. That's coaching. The next one is supporting. Notice that, let me just show you these axes for a moment. I don't know whether you can see this on the screen. Do you see the north-south axis and then the, uh, the, uh, the east-west axis on the bottom? So you'll see on the, on the, on the north-south axis, that has to do with 
supportive behavior from low to high. And on the bottom, it's directive behavior, two different types of behavior from the leader, the leader of the team. Okay. So let's say that I'm the leader of the team. So that shows the level of supportive behavior. And on the bottom, it shows directive behavior from low to high. So in the first quadrant, the, the directive behavior was really high. Supportive behavior was really low, hardly any. Okay. But you notice when we went up to the top, supportive behavior went real high. But also, it was highly directive because it was in this upper right quadrant. All right? So that's coaching. Supporting is where no longer are, or do we have the highly directive approach. So it's low in terms of directive, but it's really high on what? Supportive behavior. So this is coaching is, I'm sorry, supporting is where you are going, you can do this. I'm on your side. You're no longer giving a whole lot of direction. Run this errand. Do this play. Go here. Do this. There's not a lot of that, but there's a lot of encouragement, a lot of support, a lot of sensitivity. Okay? Go down to S4, and it's delegating. Delegating. This is the fourth style of situational leadership, which is notice that it is on the bottom left quadrant, which means what? It's low in support and it's low in direction. So it's low on both of those. So that, let me see, maybe an illustration would help you a little bit here, all right? So, show you how this can be used. So, let's say we have someone that I'm coaching, and they're on my team. And again, it goes like this, right? So, they have joined my team. So, this is team member A. Uh, I'm... The, uh, I'm the team leader. I need to determine where that leader is or that team member is at all times. When someone is new, inexperienced, immature maybe in their experience, maybe they're young in whatever uh, task that I've given them, in the beginning stages of their development, it is really important that I provide high direction and I don't have to give a whole lot of support because they just need to be told what to do. Everyone in this room, I know you have been familiar with S1 directive type leadership because, frankly, that is a traditional, classical form of leadership. Go do this. Don't do that. Make sure this is done. Very, what I would call top down leadership. Highly directive, not very supportive. The point that I'm making is there is a time where that is the right kind of leadership. When someone needs that, particularly if someone that is young, undeveloped, or immature, or they just don't know any better, they don't have any experience in your company. And you're having to basically do what? Tell them everything. Read the policy manual. Just do it. But if you have someone that you realize is in this quadrant, they're up here in the S2 quadrant. Let's just call, we'll call them B, team member B. They are someone that still needs a lot of direction. They're not experienced enough where they're at in their development. They, they need some direction, but what they really need now is they need a lot of support. They need a lot of coaching. Maybe they're in this situation. They can be in this quadrant for different reasons. Sometimes it's because they are emotionally sensitive. We were talking about emotional intelligence. Maybe they're traumatized. They've been through some abuse. 
And they don't just need direction. They need some TLC. They need someone to love on them and to care for them and to support them and to give them that kind of supportive environment so that they can succeed. Each of these are, all of these are good forms of leadership. The difference is they're situational. So the key is apply the right mix of direction and support at the right time. Because if you, if, if someone, well, I'll get to that in a moment. So B, the person is in this quadrant, they still need lots of direction and they need a lot of support from me, their supervisor. Let's say that someone is over here. This quadrant, we'll call them Mrs. C. This is uh, S3, situation three. This, over here, we need coaching. You can see from up there, but over here, this is called coaching. This is called directing. And what is the third one? What is this C called? Supporting. Hmm. Which we noticed from looking at the axis that that means what? That's low in what? Low in direction. No, hardly any direction needed here but they need a lot of support. Who would that describe? Someone maybe who's been on the team for a long while. They know the routines. They know what the policies and protocols are. You don't have to tell them everything to do, but what they really need is a lot of love and support. Good job. Good job. Keep that up. You're encouraging them, building them up. Here's the problem. Some of us who have not learned situational leadership and we are directive by nature. I'm a directional leader by nature. Just go, do it, get it done. This person will not thrive in that environment. If, if I'm still treating them like they're down here in S1, but they're actually in S3, they won't respond as well. They may suck it up and they may just, they're loyal and so they just follow the direction, but they're not really thriving because what? We've not created the situation for their own development. So am I making any sense? So high support, low direction. And we finally have this one down here. This is S4. And we'll say this is Brother D. And down here, what is there? This is a unique one because it's low. This is high on both, high support, high direction. And what is this? Low support. And low direction, how in the world could anybody thrive there? Who is this? Brother D is someone who has come a long way. They've been around for a while. They know the organization. They understand how the church works. They understand what has to be done in order to make a Sunday service work. They don't have to be given a direction anymore. They've been doing it for years. And... They are also not super sensitive anymore because emotionally they've healed up. They're secure in who they are. They know what their call is. They're secure in it. They're ready to roll. They just want to serve. This is going to do it. I'm good. I don't have to. You don't have to tell me everything to do and you don't have to pat me on the back every time that I make a mistake. I don't I don't know. I know you love me. I feel safe. I feel secure. Just let me do it. That's why this is called what? Delegating. This is where you fully delegate. That means as the supervisor or the team leader, I can truly let go. What a joy. I can let go. Knowing that this person, they've gone through training, they know what they're doing. 
They don't have to. That doesn't mean I don't love them. That doesn't mean I don't support them. But their need for a highly supportive environment is no longer there. They don't need the direction. They don't need me to spell out A, B, C every time, one, two, three. They just operate because why? They're delegated to. And they know that. So here's the, here, here's the theory. People, if we understand people that we're leading in our team, if we can figure out where they are at, what quadrant they really qualify for best, where they will thrive best, and we will adjust our leadership style to their need, to the situation. Even though I might, some, some leaders prefer to be supportive all the time. They're, they're more of the Barnabas style or the nurturing style. Some of us prefer just to give direction. Go do it. But we have to learn to what? Be flexible. Adapt. Adapt to the situation. It's not just the situation. It's the, what, it's the situation that these leaders are in. The result of me being sensitive to what quadrant that they're in, adjust, if I will adjust my leadership to their situation, the result will be what? what, what give me some ideas of the, what you think would be the result of this situational leadership model. If I'm employing this, what do you think are some of the pos positive results? People achieve more. What else? More effective. In what way? What is it? What will it produce? Why is it more effective? Back here. A better working culture. People, people will in, they'll, they'll appreciate being a part of that culture. Because if you have the old style, just the same old leadership all the time, it just doesn't create the same working culture. People aren't as happy. What else? They'll be more productive. Someone else? Yeah, you'll keep them. If you're not conscious of this, you can lose people because you're not giving them what they need to advance. So what else? I'm sorry? High productivity. The other thing that you, maybe you didn't mention, but I think it's true, is you will develop them as leaders. This is a developmental approach. So you are developing them, growing them to be more effective. Someone can start off here and literally go through this. So they literally, you can, I've done this before. I've walked someone from point A all the way, all the way through this, all the way down here. And changed at every stage the type of leadership that I'm providing for them. It's amazing how it can work. Does this make any sense to you at all? All right, time for a question or two on this before we get to one more. Yes, over here, brother. Thank you um, for such a wonderful um, delivery. Um, in my secular job that I do every day, of course, I direct, I coach, uh, I support, and I also delegate. And um, most of the time, the engineers, they work in, they work in pairs. And uh, so far, so good. But I have, I have these two guys in my team. Uh, sometimes I think they are Sambala and Tobaya, but, <laughs> but uh, of course, that would be a sin if I, yeah, so I only think it, but I've never said it. And I don't want to go that way because I know these are, and their, their skills are fantastic. They reduce fiber splicing, providing broadband for community and all that. And the two don't get along. They can't just get along. And we've changed them to work with other people who can't get along. You moved them around. Yes. Yeah. They, 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 so any, any, any pairing I do, they have problems with the other. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's really draining because almost the whole of last year, I spent time doing conflict resolution and doing pathfinding. And I don't think I have the energy for, for that anymore this year. And you talked about adjusting, you know, yourself to, to, to come to the level. You know, if you can please throw light a bit on that, and uh, please help me. I'm really um, well. It's not easy because uh, when you're frustrated, you know that it, it's like, man, I just want to be done with this. You know, 
I think it's just a lot of self-discipline. You just have to convince yourself that my adjusting my style from directing or coaching or supporting or delegating fits the situation What and ask yourself, what will help them develop most? And sometimes, I mean, honestly, like in the directing, particularly in directing uh, and coaching, you can be very confrontive, you know, to, to, in order to bring correction, in order to say, listen, this has to change. Now, once you get over to supporting and delegating, you don't need to bring as much correction. So it sounds to me like you have some people who are stuck in one and two. And uh, you, you're just going to have to just continue to be a directional leader when you need to be and a coach when you need to be. It's not easy. And because, let's face it, the, uh, a leader is only as good as the people on their team. But then leading people on your team can be a challenge, particularly if you didn't choose them, if they, they get assigned to you. So I understand. So I don't know how many great answers I have for that, but you know, I think there's one back here. Um, my question is, what are the questions that you ask to your team members to figure out what quadrant they're part of, whether it's direct, oh whether they need directing, coaching, supporting, or a delegation? And then also a second part was, if you could please mention the other nine leadership styles. I think you mentioned three. Oh my! Three. <laughs> uh, it's next if year. You... Next year's seminar. <laughs> <laughs> next year's seminar. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know. I, that's a, it's a question I'm sure that someone has written on. I don't know that I can give you a, a, a list of assessment questions, but I, I think the way I have, all I can do is reference how I know I've done it. Um, being observant, observing them, watching them, learning, uh, uh know your, know your lead, your people really well. And it's, it should be based on things like their own track record. Um, you know, you can learn that by looking at someone's background, their, their resume, their, you know what I'm saying, those kinds of things. Uh, you, you can just observe how they get along with others. That obser observation will give you a lot of information to kind of know where, where do I think that they probably fit better. You want to add to that? I wonder, is it worth speaking to them about the different areas and seeing what they also feel is would it, be the best might. for them, or uh, is it best uh, to honestly, assess it? Honestly, I think it's better for you to assess it, because sometimes I think this, we talked before about the lack of self-awareness with emotional intelligence. I think generally people are not really self-aware. And many times people misassess themselves. And so they may think, oh, I'm good for this. I can handle it. You don't need to, you don't need to provide me any support. I got this. And then you find out that, that they need more direction. So I think it's something that you learn. And there might be a good set of questions. You might want to, you might want to do a little research and just Google situational leadership questions for assessing development or something like that and see what you come up with. But uh, I've leaned on my own ability to discern, listen, evaluate, and then try to fit them in appropriately. Uh, and by the way, I didn't say this. Well, let me put it in the form of a question. Do you believe that this directional arrow can actually get reversed? Could someone be over in quadrant, supporting quadrant S3, and something happen where... You need to reframe your situational leadership back to coaching. Is that? Yeah, so it's not just one way. It, 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 and we don't need to go into variable variables and context for that, but I think that's very possible. All right, let me, uh, is there one more? One more, and I want to finish the, some notes I put on this section for you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. We are blessed by the teachings this I'm glad. afternoon. There is something I want to know from your experience. We have people that we have taken them through all this process. And they have been with you for a very long time. But they are not catching the vision of where you are going. For coaching you have, supporting you have, directing you have. Yet they are meant to take position that you can dedicate to them so that you can relax. But they are not putting their weight. When someone walk in and they show up 
and you give them the position, they begin to fight. As a leader, how do you handle it? Well, honestly, I, I'm not sure. First of all, I'm a strong believer that everyone on the team has to understand the vision. So I don't think there's an excuse for anyone that's, if you will, we'll just call it your team, that's on your team not understanding the vision. So I think that's critical just for team performance. And by all means, someone shouldn't be over here in the highly developed place of delegating without knowing the vision. I would have never, I would have never adjusted my leadership style to that if they didn't know the vision. I'd probably still have them in, in, in S1 or S2 if they didn't know the vision. So maybe you have pushed them along. Your situational leadership needs to be tweaked to be a little bit more directive until you're certain that they have the vision. That would, that would just be my observation. Okay, let me do this. Let me give you these, um, what did I call them? They're in your notes. Qualities. Qualities of a situational leader. Do you see it there in your notes? They are, number one, a, a situational leader has to be insightful. We talked about this from the sister's question. They understand the needs of their team members. They have to be flexible or adaptable. In other words, they adjust or adapt to serve the team members. Three, trustworthy. They gain trust through communication and transparency. So trust is a very important currency. I think I taught here um, last year Another recent year on the currency of trust is really, really important here. Next one is being a problem solver. You have to think big to find solutions to fit these different situations. Finally, coaching is just a general quality and it, in someone who is giving direction through support and encouragement. Um, all right, we're going to have at the close, after I finish this one more area intelligence, we're going to have a full... How are we doing on time? Yep. We're going to have a full 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A. So I know that there were some other hands up. All right. So hold your questions and we'll, we'll have a full 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A at the close. All right. So let's deal with the last one that I'm covering. Remember, I said we're not going to cover all seven here, but I, I want to cover those that I think maybe you're not as familiar with. I bet you haven't heard of this one contextual intelligence. A good friend of mine named Dr. Matt Coots, who is a professor at Bowling Green University in the U.S., um, strong man of God, great believer, but he's also a scholar. He was studying one day from uh, the scriptures, 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32, which all of you are familiar with, that speaks about the sons of Issachar. So he was meditating on that, and all of a sudden it was like, because he's trained in leadership studies and organizational psychology, he began to connect the dots with some things that he had learned in the secular arena as a scholar and researcher. And he began to develop some research and writings on the subject of what he termed, he, he came up with his language, contextual intelligence. So contextual intelligence is a fascinating look at how we learn and lead by knowing the context that we are in. So first of all, look at the scripture. It's, at the, it's on one of your pages. First Chronicles 12, 32 says what? From the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives, and all of these men understood the signs of the times, and they knew the best course for Israel to take. They knew the signs of the times, and they knew what course it should take. So the sons of Issachar are potent examples of how contextual intelligence works in a changing world or in a turbulent environment. They had two very clear distinguishing marks. And apparently, from reading the text, these were the things that qualified the sons of Issachar as excellent leaders. And they, uh, 
these two things were, one, they understood the times. So in other words, they knew how to diagnose their context. And secondly, they knew what to do or they knew how to apply the knowledge. They knew how to be strategic. This is based upon the idea that context matters. Context always matters. So let's see if I can illustrate this. Someone who is high in contextual intelligence is very aware of what's happening around them in the world, environmentally. Let's just illustrate. Um, two years into the pandemic, if you're a leader, and this may seem strange, but it was, it, there's a lot of examples of this. If you're a leader and you basically said, who cares? I don't know whether to believe the public health officials or not. And so I'm just going to keep on doing everything I used to do. I'm not going to make any change and adjustment. We would call that person not contextually aware. They're not diagnosing the context very well. And context matters for your leadership. Let's give another example. If you're in the middle of an economic depression that is affecting the whole landscape of the country or the city or the area in which you live, and you're a leader of a Christian movement, parachurch organization, or a church, should the economic conditions affect the way that you lead your church in any way? I'll qualify. I, I, I think the answer is it should. Let me qualify it, though. If we have a deep biblical conviction about something, such as, for example, people's giving. Giving, we give not based on circumstance. We give based on a spiritual discipline, practice, and obedience to the Lord, right? We have examples in the Bible where a widow was about to die, and she was giving, right? So it wouldn't be appropriate for, I think, those of us who are in this room, we agree that you're not going to compromise truth, but you do lead differently because you are sensitive to the context. And so maybe what might you do? You might provide more benevolence and support for the poor. You might find job placement. Program. You might do something different for the church in your programming because you understand the context that you're in environmentally, culturally, is different. So knowing your context. Another example would be if you go to another country that has a different culture than yours, um, you would be benefited by knowing enough about the culture to know how to function as a missionary. And if you don't respect the culture that you're in, you can get in trouble very quickly as a missionary. And you, there's actually something called the missionary complex. The missionary complex is when you go into a situation, you act like you know it all and you're importing all the truth. And the people who you're going to, they don't know what they know. What do they know? I'm here. I have the answers. That's not very contextually intelligent. So... Uh, you know, I remember the very first time back in 19, uh, 1974, end of 73, begin 1974. Some of you are aware of this, but I actually live not very far, probably 15 minutes from where we're at right here. I lived there. So moved to, I, I moved, first of all, to Northern Ireland and outside of Belfast, and then I moved here. We were working on a studio, on an album and a studio with, a, with a, a group. And I remember moving to uh, Northern Ireland and to, and to uh, Britain, and I was using words that got me in trouble. 
And how many of you know a word in one culture can mean one thing, use the same word in another culture, and it means something totally different? Oh, I was in trouble all the time because I was still using American words in a different culture. But it took me about six months, but I learned to be more contextually intelligent. Now, let's bring it more to the granular level. If you're in a room and no one's paying attention to what you're saying, some leaders just keep talking. They just keep talking. In fact, sometimes they'll just raise the volume. <laughs> they just talk a little bit louder, <laughs> thinking that maybe that's going to create interest. The reality is no one could care about what you're talking about. If you are contextually intelligent, you pick up on the room. You know your audience. That's the first rule of communication, right? Know your audience. You will begin to pick up on the fact no one's listening, no one cares. So you ought to be doing something different. Contextually intelligence means everything from a small group setting to a global setting, you are taking a look at the context and adjusting your strategies. The sons of Issachar understood the moment. They understood the times, and they knew not only did they understand the environment, they were analyzing and diagnosing the environment and the context, but they also had the wisdom to know what to do. Boy, if we had more leaders today that knew what to do. And what to do, learning what to do, rises and is informed by the context. So there's a saying, and it's just worth you noting, context matters. Context matters. So those who possess contextual intelligence are able to extract valuable information from about people, attitudes, past behaviors, and then they're able to apply them to the current moment so to know how to get the best results. More specifically, contextual intelligence is an intuitive diagnostic skill. It is an intuitive diagnostic skill that helps leaders to align your tactics and objectives to create good strategies in varying solutions. So um, I tell people frequently about contextual intelligence it really is intuitive. It's not just, in, it's not intellectual or rational. It's very intuitive. It's, it's almost sometimes, I think it's almost a spirit of discernment. It is the ability to discern and diagnose what's going on. Instead of just having your head dug in or being stuck or being careless or apathetic, you are connected and you know what's going on around you. Okay. It is 2.30, so we're going to take the next 20 to, we don't have to take it all, but we'll have available up till 3 at the last. So if you have a question uh, on any of the multiple intelligences that we've talked about, and you want to make a comment about it or ask a question about it, I'll do the best I can to answer it. So uh, you can raise your hand, and we'll simply work through these, and then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be done, and I'll be done with my portion by, by 3. All right, who's first? I think we had a hand up before that we didn't get to. Hi, could you go back to the um, situational mm -hmm. intelligence diagram for me, please? Yep. Okay, so my question is, say if we're looking at directing, what kind of ratio is healthy? Because I see you have that low supportive and not no supportive. Well, so I think it says low. Low, yeah. It says low, and you didn't put no supportive. Yeah, you're right. So what kind of ratio is healthy for that kind of leader? Whew. I think it's dependent. It just depends on the situation. You know, the whole idea here is situational leadership. So can there be varying situations within each quadrant? Of course. So there might be some that, you know, don't need you know, don't need any support. And then there's some that require a little something. So you, as a leader, that's the idea of being situational. 
you have to evaluate that, know how to read the person that you're working with, your team member, and it can fluctuate a little bit. But generally speaking, that's, you know, the support is low, the direction is high on that. So I may have exaggerated even in my description, but you, I think you understand the, con the, the concept. Good question, though. Someone else? Mine is more like a contribution. Okay. I, I think we need to understand that this is not a mathematical model that has to be applied. Okay. The, fa the main fact by the virtue of the fact that it's a supportive, um, sorry, it's a situational model. That means that leaders um, have to use their intuition, use all the skills that they have acquired over the years, their experience to be able to vary the, the, the particular quadrant that will apply in every situation. So, for example, delegating, I think, is, is one that will give your the people you're leading ownership in, in, in the vision and in, and in the um, objectives mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the church or even any other organization. But the fact remains that you need to be sensitive or, like you said, um, intuition to be able to vary it to, to match the situation. Yeah. Thank you. This, uh, this form of leadership, uh, this model of leadership, uh, the thing that makes it fascinating is some of the other models of leadership are very linear. In other words, it's like start here, you just, you do this, you do this, you know, kind of e this equals this. This particular model of leadership requires a lot of discernment, intuition, knowing people, knowing how to work, and, but, but having a heart to develop people. And uh, so that's what's a little, I think, I think it's a little bit unique about it. I, I enjoy it. It's just one model, but I think you can learn from it. Someone else. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello, Pastor. I actually have a question myself. Based on the model on flexible and adaptive leadership, how can we implement biblical literacy within our directive or supportive approaches in providing spiritual guidance and leadership. Oh boy, okay, you're integrating, you wanna know how to integrate the biblical literacy within this particular model? Um, my view is that biblical literacy as Christian spiritual leaders has to undergird and inform every, every form of leadership style, every leadership model. It, it is never optional, it's never negotiable, it's just, it's always there. So. We cannot ignore that, and, and how, we, how we integrate it, I think we all know the more that we understand that uh, the Word of God not only changes the way we think, it transforms us to act like Jesus. It's going to affect the way that we lead a team. It's going to affect the way that we, uh, it's going to affect our intelligence on every level. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's integral, and it's, not, and it's really non-negotiable. So I don't know if that gives you enough detail to, to help. All right, other questions, comments? There's one right there. There's one right there. Thank you. Um, this is just a contribution. It's the biblical intelligence and con conceptual intelligence. Uh, as a, a young person, I, I had the privilege of um, studying strategic management. And at the time, my company was executing a World Bank project. And they wanted us to understand strategy. So B the British government brought people to train. You know, it's a whole postgraduate uh, qualification. And the examination was supervised by the British Council of Ghana. But one thing that was strange was the document that was used to train us as strategists and strategic consultants was the Bible. And from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible is a strategic document. And that is what, if you notice, through the world, every government, their policies, their constitutions are all based on the Bible. They are all coming from a background of strategy. So I'm so happy that today you were really driving home the importance of biblical intelligence. If you take our time, last Sunday we had a pastor who came to preach to us, Pastor Champo, and he told us the Bible 
moves from one stage to another. So we should take our time, not digging in and digging out, but consciously starting from Genesis and going to Revelation with the patience and the tolerance and everything like this for us to understand it. And by the time we finish, just like what you have just said about uh, the children of Issachar, that they understood the times. If you have the biblical background, you always have a short story. This is just a short one. I tell people, there's some issues they said, don't, you don't need to pray. And I always remind them of the story of I, that the Israelites thought they were winning all the battle, and they underestimated I, and the, the, the people conquered them. They went back to God. They said, God, but this is just a small, even we conquered massive ones. And God told them, you thought it was your strength. So no matter what we are doing, even with all these things we are learning today, we thank you very much for, you know, you always come and link <laughs> the, I don't know how to put it, but the biblical with the reality so that we can always make sure the two is working together. Yeah, so I want to thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pastor Bobby. Yeah, I want to reflect on situational leadership. Okay. The qualities, you said two things that are very important, flexibility and also trustworthiness. And I want to contribute the four quadrant. Delegating is low in supportive and low in directing. I want to emphasize that it doesn't mean it's zero supporting, right. zero directing. Oh, that's true. Most of the time, the church set up when people are heading committees, they think it's zero directing, zero right. support. Right. But I want to emphasize it's low. So they are still yeah. accountable to the yeah. top pastor. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. So I just want to make that clear. Yeah. yeah. I, I totally agree, Pastor. Uh, what I would just say is the, the direction from the direct supervisor or the direct team leader, I think that's the suggestion here. Organizationally, you know, be, just because it's delegated to someone doesn't mean, all right, now do whatever you want to do. It, there's some assumptions there. The assumption is that you're in, in alignment with the organizational vision, the organizational values, and, and stuff. So, yeah, there's exceptions to all, all, all of this. But there was someone over here, too. Um, hi, Lord. <laughs> My voice is a bit low. It's okay. So, um, I just want to add to the S4. I think the brother there was talking about one of his leaders that he spent so much time into them and they always cause some right. problem. Um, there are some people that when they are on the S4, they sometimes they believe knowledge is power, but knowledge is not always power, but if you have learned the, what you think is knowledge so wrong and you are not willing to adapt of um, learn from not to adapt from others in your circle uh -huh. and you stick in your way sometimes you can affect those other people in the group so to that I think he should try and with the small knowledge that I know that he should try and find a way to um, take him away from the group before he affects the other group and while waiting there you go he's offering you some <laughs> wisdom there all right and while waiting <laughs> you pray on his behalf and you know, hope that he sees what he's doing wrong and learn uh -huh. from others good maybe you'll become a consultant all right good good for you <laughs> other questions we can wrap this up if, if there are any, uh, over here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neil. My question is, you are leading a group from S1, and the goal is to reach S4 with your team. And how do you um, know who to progress? to S2 or S3 or to S4 without offending others who will still remain at S1. Yeah. And how do you also address 
them in general without making them feel that? Sure. Well, the, I would just say a few things. First of all, this model has is not about moving a team through these levels. It's about the individual. So on a, any given team, you might have people representing each quadrant. It's very possible. Uh, how do you deal with that to where you're not offending people? First of all, I think we have to develop a transparent environment where people are all secure and safe uh, and they know that they're loved. But I'll just give you an example. So, uh, so uh, I'm leading a group and there's one member of the group that is consistently late. It's brilliant, capable, always late. Always 10 minutes late. So I let it go, let it go, let it go. Uh, a couple of the other members of the team would make a comment, which meant they're aware. Um, so after a number of gatherings, I said, hey, could you stick around after the meeting just for a moment? Pulled him aside and said, you know that I love you. And I said, I'm so blessed to have you a part of this group and you have so much to contribute. But do you realize that you obviously have a blind spot? And if I'm going to help you grow, I have to point out a blind spot that's going to that's going to hold you back. Are you aware that you are consistently late to every meeting? All of a sudden, he said, I'm aware. He said, would you help me to break that habit? So no one had ever spoken to him about his habit of being late. And so I said, yes, I will help you. Let's talk about why are you late? And then we began to get into some of the, the root issues that were causing it. And so he said, would you hold me accountable? And I said, you bet, I sure will. And so from that point on, uh, I would point out, and, and, and of course, whenever he was on time, what, what, what do you think would I should do? God, I should celebrate it. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't make it a big public thing, but I loved on him and encouraged him and said, well done, good job. And then the next week he's late again, you know? So why? Because it's a habit. It takes time to break habits or to build habits. So my point is, is that you can do it in a, in a caring way and it doesn't have to shame them and it doesn't have to affect the whole group. But I think what happens in if you have a team that's pretty transparent and relational, some teams, depending on the context, sometimes at work, it's not very interpersonal, might just be functional. But if it's a team that gets really interpersonal, everybody knows. Everybody recognizes where different people are at. You don't have to tell them. And you, you can actually, as the team leader, you can coach someone well and someone else delegate more to them. And they can actually be developed by observing one another on the same team. And they realize that, you know, Mary doesn't seem to need as much uh, support as I need. And they, that will motivate them and inspire them to grow. So just keep in mind, it's for, it, it, it can be individually applied. It doesn't have to be the, the group moving as a whole through, through, through the process. Okay? Someone else? Anyone else? All right. I think it's time for us to ask God for help. What do y'all think? Huh? Has anybody been challenged? Challenged to grow, become more effective. Hopefully you can learn all of these intelligences. Can you imagine having leadership competencies that would cover all of these seven areas? Wow. It'd be amazing. So let's just uh, pray together and then I'll turn this over to the leaders. Father God, I'm praying for every person in this room. They're here because they're leaders or they want to be leaders and they have a heart to grow and develop. We pray that you would keep our hearts and our minds open, that we would learn, that we would grow with the word of God as our foundation and as our bedrock for all things. Lord, help us to learn from others and 
how to be more effective in our leadership. Help us to become 360 degree leaders, knowing our past with hindsight, our present with insight, and our future with foresight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. You can do better for Jesus.